climate science was a respected field of science up until about 30 years ago. And that's when alarmists began to ignore scientific discipline. Global climate change is a scientific question, and it's dependent on scientific data to understand it. Well, as you know, scientists have always questioned accepted theories. Back in the 1980s, a small group of individuals became very concerned about the Earth's temperature and what it might do in the future. I hesitate to call them scientists because they abandoned the scientific principles by uh, which their uh, guess about future temperature increases and its cause could achieve scientific acceptance or rejection. Global warming alarmists focused on the small temperature increase since the Industrial Revolution, and they hypothesized that the tiny amount of carbon dioxide that humans were generating was controlling the temperature of our planet. They could have made their case by collecting and making available solid evidence to support their hypothesis, and two, by defending their claims in the court of scientific inquiry not in the court of public opinion. Instead, they refused to release their data that would permit other scientists to replicate their results, if that was possible. Today's public really doesn't know what to believe about when it comes to humans causing global warming. Politicians, in the absence of knowledge and understanding about climate science, have put themselves out on a limb <clears throat> from which they find it very difficult to retreat. The alarmists have managed to sell the media, <clears throat> excuse me, the media and the public on human-caused global warming and something that they've invented called consensus science. Those of us skeptical of those scientists' claims are labeled as climate deniers, or fake experts, or against climate change. Well, instead of presenting data to prove their hypothesis, the alarmists challenge skeptics like us to disprove that hypothesis. And while scientists are best qualified to deal with the scientific and the academic aspects of that question, all of us will suffer the financial consequences of actions that are take, taken based on bad science. Today's global warming war is a battle to avoid governmental control of energy consumption and the lowering of our standard of living. Well, the only thing that alarmists are able to cite in support of their simplistic hypothesis hypotheses, I guess, are the mathematical models which they developed to prove that human-caused carbon dioxide is a dominant factor in controlling the Earth's temperature. Well, these climate models have never successfully predicted anything. And keep in mind, models are based on assumptions. That's opinions. If their bases for, are the, <clears throat> if the bases for these assumptions are wrong, the results can never accurately predict future behavior. And as realists, we should be emphasizing that models are not data. It's a, a myth, okay, and now there's a lot, lot more of them that are closer to home and that are likely to cost you, cost you a lot of money. And, and, and we ought to keep all that stuff in mind. Global warming. This is one of those cool things where there is not a shred of evidence. And I'm, I'm, I'm not lying to you. The CO2 has such a tiny effect. Even the CO2 that's there, the bulk of which isn't our problem, it just, it's always there. You know, 
and the, and the guys that are now running that, like the people that got in trouble with Hadley Center, yeah, which is a, a uni like University of East Anglia in England that got their, their emails all published and some of them were kind of embarrassing. But those guys, they're like computer jocks. They're not climatologists. And climatology has become a kind of a joke. The people that are real climatologists do think about things like the, all the, the global epochs that the Earth has gone through in our way of looking at it. But the, the guys that are getting the headlines and stuff and that are meeting in Copenhagen and deciding that everybody's got to stop cooking over sterno stoves in Africa or whatever, I mean, those people don't know nothing. They really don't. And, and if you read it, it's boring. It's clearly not made for you to understand. They have so many acronyms in the papers, like in science and nature. You know, every time they use a, a, a phrase, they immediately reduce it to a four letters or whatever, and it makes it hard for a non-specialist to understand what they're talking about. You have to go back and forth and back and forth. What the hell does this stand for? What does this mean? Why don't they just write it? Ink is not that expensive. And it's just, it, it makes it hard for someone who's a non-specialist to really understand what those things are. And this is in, in, in magazines like Science and Nature that are really written, supposedly, for the non-specialist, scientifically trained person. And in my opinion, all that stuff should get out of there. It makes them talk to themselves, basically, rather than to other people. And, and then they start having these big, you know, then they talk to people like Al Gore and they say, hey Al, here's a great way for you to make money now that you're not the vice president. And, <laughs> and they're all doing it in, you know, like it's for the earth. Save the earth from people or something. I'm not sure what it is. I know I'm not causing climate change. I mean, when I'm riding my bicycle, I'm blowing out a little CO2, but, and there's probably somebody with a satellite watching me. You know, the IPCC is always checking you out, and they're, they're going to say, you're polluting, and <clears throat> I'm just breathing. <laughs>
is maintaining its integrity. In an exclusive interview Sunday with the Daily Mail, Noah whistleblower Bates said, quote, they had good data from buoys and they threw it out and corrected it by using the bad data from ships. You never change good data to agree with the bad, but that's what they did, so as to make it look as if the sea was warmer. In a blog post, Bates skewered the study's author, Tom Carl, that he, quote, constantly had his thumb on the scale in the documentation, scientific choices, and release of data sets, all to discredit the notion of a global warming hiatus. I thank the chairman and the ranking members for the opportunity to offer testimony today. Prior to 2009, I felt that supporting the IPCC consensus on climate change was a responsible thing to do. I bought into the argument, don't trust what one scientist says, trust what an international team of a thousand scientists has said after years of careful deliberation. That all changed for me in November 2009 following the leaked climate gate emails that illustrated the sausage making and even bullying that went into building the consensus. I started speaking out, saying that scientists needed to do better at making the data and supporting information publicly available being more transparent about how they reach conclusions, doing a better job of assessing uncertainties, and actively engaging with scientists having minority perspectives. The response of my colleagues to this is summed up by the title of a 2010 article in the Scientific American, Climate Heretic Judith Curry Turns on Her Colleagues. I came to the growing realization that I had fallen into the trap of groupthink. I had accepted the consensus based on second-order evidence, the assertion that a consensus existed. I began making an independent assessment of topics in climate science that had the most relevance to policy. And what have I concluded from this assessment? Human-caused climate change is a theory in which the basic mechanism is well understood, but whose magnitude is highly uncertain. No one questions that surface temperatures have increased overall since 1880, or that humans are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, or that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have a warming effect on the planet. However, there is considerable uncertainty and disagreement about the most consequential issues, whether the warming has been dominated by human causes versus natural variability, how much the planet will warm in the 21st century, and whether warming is dangerous. The central issue in the scientific debate on climate change is the extent to which the recent and future warming is caused by humans versus natural climate variability. Research effort and funding has focused on understanding human causes of climate change. However, we have been misled in our quest to understand climate change by not paying sufficient attention to natural causes of climate variability in particular from the sun and from the long-term oscillations in ocean circulations. Why do scientists disagree about climate change? The historical data is sparse and inadequate. There's disagreement about the value of different classes of evidence, notably the value of global climate models. There's disagreement about the appropriate logical framework for linking and assessing the evidence. And scientists disagree over assessments of areas of ambiguity and ignorance. How then and why have climate scientists come to a consensus about a very complex scientific problem that the scientists themselves acknowledge has substantial and fundamental uncertainties? Climate scientists have become entangled in an acrimonious political debate that has polarized the scientific community. As a result of my analyses that challenge IPCC conclusions, I have been called a denier by other climate scientists and most recently by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. My motives have been questioned by Representative Grijalva in a recent letter sent to the president of Georgia Tech. There is enormous pressure for climate scientists to conform to the so-called consensus. This pressure comes not only from politicians, but from federal funding agencies, universities and professional societies, and scientists themselves who are green activists. Reinforcing this consensus are strong monetary, reputational, and authority interests. In this politicized environment, advocating for carbon dioxide emissions reductions is becoming the default expected position for climate scientists. 
This advocacy extends to the professional society that published journals and organized conference. Policy advocacy, when combined with understating the uncertainties, risks destroying science's reputation for honesty and objectivity, without which scientists become regarded as merely another lobbyist group. Become so politicized on the topic, she can no longer handle what she calls the craziness of it all. Dr. Curry joins us now. Professor Curry, thanks for coming on tonight. Um, Talk to so, it's a pleasure. Well, thank you. It is for me. So you have written that part of the problem with climate science, not just at your school but at others, is that research money only goes to researchers pursuing certain lines of inquiry and that they're all the same and that that prevents good science from ha happening. Am I mischaracterizing you? Um, not really, but it, what you're seeing is there's this dominant theme of human caused climate change, which is where all of the research and the focus is being directed, and there's far too little um, funding and effort go going into understanding natural climate variability. That's my concern. For your position, and I think I'm just quoting you what you said, we really can't tell. You're not sticking on a hard position either way, but you're sort of open-minded, it sounds like. Do you believe you are penalized for that view? Oh, I've, I've been vilified um, by some of my colleagues who are activists and don't like anybody challenging, you know, the, their big story. So, I mean, I walk around with knives sticking out of my back. Yeah. And, you know, in the university environment, I just felt like I was beating my head against the wall and not being effective. What's so curious, though, I mean, I live in a similar world, but it's a political world where people disagree and they have strong beliefs and ideologies and they attack each other of them. But that's sort of the opposite of what I understood science to be, where you were led by inquiry and evidence to conclusions, right? Oh, exactly. Universities should be places of unfettered research, freedom of investigation, honest and open debate, diverse perspectives, etc. And in certain fields, you know, that are politically relevant, you're definitely not seeing that. I am John Christie, uh, professor of atmospheric science at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. We don't play football at my campus. And Alabama's state climatologist. I have served in many climate capacities, including as a lead author of the United Nations IPCC. My research might best be described as building data sets from scratch to advance our understanding of what the climate is doing and why it does what it does. The main point of my testimony is simple. There is no causal link between the elimination of any single project and changes in the global climate. Thus, no individual product, uh, project should be held up due to climate change concerns. But let me go much, much further. Suppose the United States closed everything and ceased to exist on this day, May 13th, 2015. No people, no cars, no industry, no utilities. Climate models tell us the result of this imaginary scenario in 50 years might be a few hundredths of a degree, an amount smaller than the amount by which the global temperature already bounces around from one month to the next. The impact would be so small as to be unattributable to regulation. This result is well known as described in my written testimony. I have presented similar calculations in federal court that went uncontested. But we should back up a bit and address the presumed causal link between CO2 emissions and climate change. You know, we monitor the climate for such variables as temperature. What we do not have is a direct and observable means to tell us why those changes occur. Our thermometers only tell us what has happened. They do not tell us why it happened. To understand why these changes occur, we use climate models whose equations attempt to contain all of the important factors that affect climate. If they are accurate, we can then see how each factor, such as rising greenhouse gases, affects the climate and whether CO2 would be the cause of the changes we see. As shown in my written testimony and up on the uh, chart here, the models fail the simplest of validation tests. They can't even reproduce what has already happened. 
all 102 model runs warm up the planet more than has actually occurred in the past 36 years. On average, the warming rate of the atmosphere in these models is three times reality. As a consequence, our science has not established the causal link between CO2 emissions and what the climate is actually doing. Therefore, emissions cannot be used as a proxy for climate change. Further, the CEQ guidance gives a list of weather and climate events it claims are increasing due to extra greenhouse gases. But as demonstrated in my written testimony, several of these phenomena have shown no change while CO2 emissions have risen, so there is no proof of a link. This evidence indicates that it has not been established that CO2 emissions have a confident and quantifiable causal link to climate change, whether one is talking about global temperature or about disruptive weather events. The former Prime Minister John Howard has lashed out at the teaching of climate change in schools. Mr Howard made the remarks at the launch of the latest book by geologist Professor Ian Plymer. The book is called How to Get Expelled from School and has 101 questions for students to ask teachers about climate change. Mr Howard says the progressive left has seized the education system and children are being taught about climate change uncritically. There has been a very significant capture of the education system on this subject and people ought to be worried about what their children are being taught at school. Uh, look at this quote. Okay. <laughs> this is a stunner. Read this, sports fans. There's a whole area of climate so-called science that is really more like a cult. It's like Hare Krishna or something like that. They're glassy-eyed and they chant. It will potentially harm the image of all science. Wait for it. That is from Princeton, emeritus physics professor and former director of the Office of Science at the Department of Energy, William Happer, who joins us now. Professor, that's about as strongly worded statement as I've ever heard. Are you anti the climate science people? Well, yes, but let me take this opportunity to apologize to the Hare Krishna people who <laughs> have noble goals. And I, I really am sorry I used that simile. Uh, so, uh, well, what exactly are you saying? Are you saying that climate scientists walk in lockstep and they're not allowed to break out of that? Is that it? No, there are many very good climate scientists. I especially admire climate scientists who do measurements, you know, of... Uh, temperatures from satellites, uh, properties of the ocean from buoys, you know, concentrations of CO2. These are good scientists and uh, we should support them. I'm all for them. But there's a, a cult that's built up around them, you know, and uh, any time you confront them, uh, instead of talking about the science, uh, they talk about 97% agree with us, you know, we have to be right, you know. Mm -hmm. so. That's what I meant by a cult. Um, it, could, could, I, could anyone get a job in the climate science department of a major university if they're not gung-ho global warmers? I don't think so, uh, certainly not for the last few years, but I hope that will change because there's a lot of important climate science that ought to be done and I, I hope it will be done. You're not a skeptic, are you? you? You do believe that the climate is changing and it's human beings who are at least partly responsible. That, I think, is your position. Yes, I, I think the human contribution, however, is very, very small. You know, I think most of the climate change we're seeing is, is natural. You know, climate has always changed. Who denies that climate changes? You know, you have to be completely blind to deny that. Mm. Uh, is the planet, uh, can, can the planet be saved? Are we doomed? Because that's what we constantly hear. We've only got a few years left. Well, uh, no, that, I mean, uh, of course not. It, it's, uh, it's a problem with science illiteracy. You know, most people don't realize that the normal CO2 levels have typically been measured in thousands of parts per million, not the puny 400 or so we have today. And the Earth thrives, so the, the idea that the Earth has never had high CO2 levels, it's completely false. Most of the time, it's never had such low levels as we have now. <laughs> you see, you so see, so why don't, don't you learn this. some facts out there? We never hear this. We just never, ever hear this. It's an ethical decision that you yeah. guys have made to tell the truth. Yes. And the truth is paramount. Nobody is above the law. No. All are equal under the law. And you mentioned something very important in your talk. 
which was prompted by a member of the audience, okay. they asked, is this fraud? And you said, yes, it is fraud. So as far as your research goes, can you just introduce very briefly um, what, what your area of research okay. is? Because we're going to show your talk um, linked to this video. Yeah. I mean, I have been working in many disciplines, but sea level is, of, of course, my main business. I have been working there since the middle of the 60s, and I have so and all the all the new theories on sea level research I have launched through the years, I think, and I have gone from from the local area up to the planetary solar uh, influence. So yes, I, I I know it, and in this case. It was the question about the satellite altimetry, which is a wonderful tool because it opened measurements in the whole of the oceans. Can you just explain what that is? For okay, you, you, send a t you send a satellite around the Earth, measure the distance from the satellite to the water level. And uh, that changes is repeated and repeated, and then you can see how uh, <clears throat> the water level changes both horizontally and vertically. And from those measurements, the mean of all the oceans, they claim, <coughs> one school says it's 3.2 millimeter rise per uh, year, the other say that it's 2.9, and it's a small difference, but it's there. <coughs> and um, the question is then, are they correct? Because they doesn't, they doesn't conquer with observational facts at all, and not at all. So we see what had, have they done. To begin with, the first uh, eight years measurements, when they released it, after all this, so to say, physical correction they needed, <coughs> it was a straight line with a variability on it. So there was no trend. Then suddenly in 2003, it became a trend. They lifted up the whole previous measured series by 2.3 millimeter per year. So they got the trend. And of course, if they made a correction, they have to tell that they have made a correction. And they didn't do that. And that, that, that is a scientific crime. You, you must do that. And you must specify then, if you can, why you have done it. But when we look at this correction, which have been accelerated a little <coughs> later, the, um, about um, 2.5, 2.7, is the addi total uh, addition they have done. <clears throat> they, cannot, they cannot explain it, they don't do it, and it is in complete disagreement with observation effect. So I looked back on it, and uh, then I could see well, what they have been doing, and I tried to correlate it back to what it should be, without corrections. And then I get from one station, 0.65 millimeter per year and the other 0.45 millimeter. So about 0.5 millimeter uh, is the trend from satellite altimetry, which is in perfect harmony with observational facts. So, so finally, we have got more or less a um, uh, similar picture from all the various um, sources of evidence we have. But then, of course, now back to your fraud. Uh, is that they have added subjective correction. I mean, you can add correction, but you must specify it. They didn't specify it, and the correction is done in order to get the trend. And that is not good enough. And uh, I think uh, that <coughs> becomes an illusion, and that makes uh, uh, all, all that record wrong. And if you now compare all the various sources of information we have, it is a spectrum between one millimeter per year and zero millimeter per year. Somewhere there is the global variability. For sea level, it's not the same all over the world, but that, that's, that's where. If we have a, f a few areas, we have fantastic <coughs> possibility of testing it. And I have shown those test areas. And they, for them, it is, this is, of course, the highest priority, because there we can test it with time and so on. And uh, this is what my life has been to. And then back also to see the various driving parameters, so how you understand it. But yes, this correction is not good. Um, just like a few words on what you think the future holds for real science. Oh, real science, I think 
when we started the project I IPCC in uh, <clears throat> 1987, earlier we were oh, primarily climate and sea level for sure, 100 percent, were driven by geologists. Then something happened because uh, it was taken over by a meteorologist and instead of having observation I had computer models and it, I think it failed and it even brought down science into what I call anti-science it's the opposite to it and that is terrible for science because we want to be we can have di different opinions of wonderful that is how science goes forward but you must rely on things which we know, not just uh, uh, put figures from, uh, from <coughs> nowhere just so that it fits a model. Models are not good enough. No. Reality. We have to stick to reality. So, um, but if we ever can, can do that, we, have, we are trying, like this meeting, we are trying to present real hard facts, uh, um, scientific data. If that is enough, I don't know. And we try it with this <coughs> ethical thing because you have to be, if you lie and say the wrong thing, at least you have to be ashamed. And we can we put your finger on that. No, this is not correct. Or you make tremendous exaggerations and so on. I have one comment on this. This transition which uh, Franco talked about. Of course, for me, that is very important because we go from a lot of ice to no ice or to the present type of ice. So an uh, enormous amount of ice was melting at a very, very, very high speed. And still, sea level didn't rise more than one meter per century. And that figure, one meter per century, we can never in present day even come close to it. So anyone saying that it would be one meter or more, they don't know what they're talking about. We are talking about centimeters, a decimeter at the most. And that is geology. The other is model speaking, and we don't like that. That's right. So it's a consensus that's been enforced by people who, who have not been honest about the data, and it's, it's been very, very exaggerated in recent years. I think it's two, two schools. When in Diola you have your school, we have all our basic training. We must look in nature <coughs> itself. From there we make our deductions of what it is. The new school, they wanted... To, to solve a problem which they only, already knew what it was, to, show, to present data which showed that it had been anthropogenic. That is not science. It's mo modeling, and it's even, you can even say it's fiddling with, uh, with modeling. We've got Colonel Cunningham sitting down here on the left. <clears throat> Walt and I go back a few years ago, having triggered a letter to NASA admonishing NASA for making unsubstantiated <laughs> claims, alarmist claims about global warming. It got international attention, but then it faded pretty fast because it didn't have any impact on our commander in chief. He ignored it. And uh, anyway, that's that. In addition to his uh, bow that you have in the, in the thing there, Walt has degrees in physics and geophysics. So he's more than just an ordinary astronaut. He's also a physicist and he was founder of Earth Awareness Foundation and was also on the advisory board of the National Renewable Energy Lab for five minutes. Tom, go get them. Thank you very much, Leighton. Let's see if I can get these slides to work. Not quite. Uh, you all had this card in your packet, so my contact information is on there. So I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Uh, <clears throat> We have a world here, it's your world, but it's kind of been taken away by Al Gore and the IPCC. Now, how did they take it away? Well, they told you sea level was going to rise. In fact, this is the specter that you're getting. This is Heidi Cullum's book, Weather of the Future. This will never happen, not in anybody's lifetime in this room or anybody anywhere else. Uh, but it does sell books. And that's one of the problems uh, we're being sold a bill of goods. This is the, let me go back into the past. Uh, about 130,000 years ago, 120,000 years ago, we had sea levels approaching what we have today, right up here. Then the, the giant glaciers formed uh, when they started melting 18,000 years ago. Sea levels rose again, and now they've kind of flattened out. 
The IPCC is predicting something else. Uh, they're saying that uh, by the end of this century, we're going to have one additional meter of sea level rise in their highest, uh, what they call them, representative concentration pathways. Uh, and they're related to CO2. More emissions, the greater the pathway. Uh, one meter is almost, uh, it's about 40 inches. Uh, that's an awful lot of sea level rise in, in a century. Now, not to be outdone, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers decides, well, we're going to go for two meters, uh, 1.8 really, and they have three different pathways, uh, scenario one, two, and three, and well, this is the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, let's see, this is not working. There we go. Let me go back one more. I get the right one here? Yeah. This is now the uh, National Climate Assessment that was just published a few weeks ago. Now they're saying six and a half feet. The lowest is 20 centimeters down here, and that is still double the rate that we've had sea level rise in the last 170 years. Uh, they're, ne they're never going to see the top one either. Now this is Jim Hansen. Now Jim Hansen, by the way, if we go back, uh, in 1988, he was asked by a reporter, uh, how do you see things in 40 years? And he says, well, you see the highway down there, the West Side Highway outside of his office? It's not going to be there anymore. Uh, based on a doubling of CO2 from pre-industrial times. Well, right now we've gone uh, 25 years into that 40 years. We've had one inch of sea level rise. There are 10 feet to go for him to make his prediction and it's got to happen within the next 15 years. I want to make it clear. Um, I'm representing a team of scientists that uh, call ourselves the Right Climate Stuff Research Team. Uh, we're uh, more than 25 uh, retired scientists and engineers from the uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston. Uh, Tom, who lives in Maine, is a member. Uh, Bob Bowman here is from Maryland. We have uh, others from around the country who have joined with us. And we also have a few people from the Houston uh, community who are not uh, NASA uh, former employees, but they are very uh, highly credentialed uh, research people uh, from Shell Research and Dow Chemical that were studying this climate thing long before uh, we NASA guys got interested. So I want to make it clear that uh, this is a team effort, and I just happen to be the spokesman today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how the international climate community talks about how sensitive our climate is to CO2 and other greenhouse gases. The holy grail of climate science is trying to define something they call equilibrium climate sensitivity. And it's loosely defined as the global average temper rise, temperature rise that will eventually result from doubling CO2 level in the atmosphere. If you read the IPCC reports, it's pretty loosely defined that way. And their more recent AR4 and AR5 reports are incomplete and misleading. Uh, the double CO2 level in the climate model solutions is artificially held constant. It's, it's a step function forcing. But in actuality, the ecosystem of the Earth removes half of the CO2 emissions we put into the atmosphere every year, like clockwork. But in an equilibrium climate sensitivity solution, they're arbitrarily holding it constant, which is unrealistic. The other thing they don't tell you is that it takes more than a thousand years for the climate to equilibrate to this artificial forcing and reach the final equilibrium sensitivity number. Our CO2 regulations are based on what's going to happen in the next 100 to two to 200 years. So equilibrium climate sensitivity is unrealistic, has nothing to do with our climate for the next 300 years. Yet that's what the EPA is using to regulate CO2 emissions. 
things have really gotten out of kilter here. The other metric that climate science uses is called transient climate response, and that's defined as the global warming that would result from increasing atmospheric CO2 levels at a rate of 1% per year until the double CO2 level is reached. This also is very artificial and it can only be calculated with a climate model. Uh, but it's more like the slow rate at which CO2 is rising in our atmosphere. Even now, at a fairly high rate of CO2 emissions, our CO2 levels are climbing only at about half this rate. So even that transit climate response metric is not realistic. So typical of climate science over-reliance on unvalidated models and not enough on data is that neither of the two metrics the IPCC uses, ECS and TCR, neither metric can be verified with physical data. You can't catch them. You can't question them. You have to have a very complex climate model to, to run and get these numbers. To me, they're totally meaningless. If you can't verify your, your crucial metric with data, what good is it? So I'm pretty, I'm pretty, after looking at this for a couple years, I, I think I'm going to quit calling them climate scientists until they get a metric that can be verified with physical data. Because scientists look at data, not just models. Why is climate change still a controversial issue? Well, I think it's because this global warming war is being fought on a number of fronts. There's a scientific front on which we're winning. And there's the media front, the public perception front, and the political front, which now also encompasses education. Our challenge is to focus on the public's perception of global warming issues. And the real battle today, and where we appear to be losing, is on the media front. The media plays the most influential role in the public perception, and to some degree, with the politicians. We have allowed alarmists to seize the semantic high ground. That's a tactic that has helped move the subject away from the scientific arena and into the political and economic arenas. The media, the public, and most politicians have little scientific literacy, with some rare exceptions, I agree, and they show very little interest in gaining it. And that does not prevent the media from playing a major role in this fight. Many journalists are aggressively pushing human-caused global warming, and they influence a great many readers and listeners. Our challenge at this stage in this war is to engage the alarmists on the media front and bring the media and the public back to reality. Alarmists refuse to accept that today's weather is within historical natural climate variability and they are reluctant to admit that man has little control over nature. That is why global warming is sometimes referred to as a religion with the alarmists. To take global warming on faith, you have to reject empirical data and what we have learned about climate change over the centuries and embrace the unproven hypothesis that humans are responsible for global temperature changes. These true believers in humans controlling the Earth's temperature cannot be reasoned out of their position. It was not reason that got them there in the first place. It was emotion and politics. <coughs> Today, the politicization of science is pushing global warming fears in our universities and in K-12 education. For example, the new Common Core Framework for Science, for science Education states that fossil fuels are the cause of catastrophic global warming. 
Common Core is also saying that man, not nature, has been the main driver of climate change for most of the past century. While scientists are making it increasingly plain that humans have little influence over the Earth's temperature, the alarmists are still winning on the media front, the political front, and the public front, which means we have to do a better job of communicating. Realists need to engage the alarmists on the media front to bring the media and the public back to reality. We should all be telling the media, excuse me, and the public not to just buy the opinions of others. That includes my opinion. Look at the empirical data themselves. Emphasize that empirical data is not just another opinion. Emphasize that man's historical ability to adapt to temperature changes and how energy consumption has raised our standard of living. Quit letting alarmists control nomenclature. We should emphasize that the argument is not about climate change. It's about the cause of climate change. When writing and speaking, we skeptics should consistently refer to the alarmist claims as human-caused global warming. Don't refer to it as anthropogenic warming, AGW, climate change, or climate disruption. We should make it plain that human-caused global warming is not a scientific theory. It's how the alarmists choose to look at temperature, at the temperature change in the ongoing human-caused global warming war. This battle for public perception may be more critical than the scientific front. Human-caused global warming may be the biggest scientific myth-based scam in our history. And this fight should not be beneath the dignity of climate science realists, especially when we're dealing with the media. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we're getting ready for question and answer. I want to ask one question to Dr. Hal over here. Dr. Hal, I promised everybody you were going to tell them what you thought the maximum temperature rise was going to be by the end of this century. So I'm going to ask you the first question. Do you want to tell them that? <laughs> yeah. When we determined our transient climate sensitivity value and we put an upper bound on it of uh, 1.8 degrees centigrade, we looked at our projected CO2 rise for the rest of this century and that transient climate sensitivity and we predict less than one degree C rise by 2100. That's all we can see from the data. And our projection of how CO2 is going to rise in the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels. Yeah. Good.